Uh, I'd rather not use it, but again, the camera so that the people can hear me. So, right, so we're going to talk one on one. We're going to cover some basic material, but try to uh, make it interesting enough for people who've been doing this while also make it accessible for people who haven't been doing this. Okay. And that's always the challenge is to meet people where they're at in the room. Again, questions will help me do that. One of the things that helps me do that is to learn where you're coming from. So I'm going to ask you what kind of, what field of uh, work that you do um, so I can get a sense of who's in the room. Okay. So who does development like I do? Who's on my team? Developers? Cool. Excellent. Excellent. How about contractors? Got, I know we got one here. Any, any other contractors? Got a couple over there. Um, property management? Yes. Excellent. Um, how about finance? Um, lenders, investors, allocators? Cool. Social service providers? Yep. A few of those. Cool. And who did I miss? Recruiting. Cool. Yeah. I also forgot architects. Any architects in there? There's one. All right. So that's that's generally what we get is a smattering of people from different uh, parts of the field. Yes, sir. Nonprofit advocates. Yes, we need you. Thank you. Uh, we're all advocates, though, aren't we? All right. So this is what we're going to uh, try to cover today. So basic definition of what is affordable housing. Uh, what are the definitions behind uh, the phrase? What's the process? How do we get from concept to build out and complete projects? Um, number three there, how is it funded? Where do the uh, dollars come from and how do we get them into the project? And how do we, then we're going to dive in a little deeper and try to figure out how we make it pencil. How does the, like the financing work conceptually? Uh, that guy just walked in and walked out. So that's not a good sign. That's like, I know him too. I'm gonna have to talk to him later. Uh, and then if we have time, we'll talk about what the future looks like. I wanna tell you a little bit about Beacon Development Group, not as an ad, just to tell you where I'm coming from, okay? And, and what, the, what experience I bring to this conversation. So Beacon Development Group is an affordable housing development consultant. We've been around for about 20 years doing development consulting in Washington State. We also have a parent company called Human Good, and they do affordable senior housing uh, throughout the West Coast. So we do development for both nonprofits and housing authorities, and then we also develop the senior affordable properties for our, uh, for our parent company. We've done uh, about 100 projects and all different types families, uh, farm workers, special needs, et cetera. So pretty broad range of, of project types. Also, I think this will be available. Uh, Bob or Claire, will this be available through the conference, the slide deck be available through the website? Yeah, so take notes, take photos if you like, um, but this is fully available to you. Uh, to, to download. I also want to show you some pictures of affordable housing projects because sometimes people come to this and they have a different idea of what affordable housing looks like than what folks at this conference are, are actually doing in the field of affordable housing. Affordable housing um, done right, obviously, is well-designed, well-built, a uh, long-term asset for the residents and for the community. So here are some different project types. This is a farm worker project in the city of Pasco. There's an affordable senior project in the city of Bremerton. Uh, this is uh, our favorite project. You know, you have favorite kids. Everybody has a favorite kid, right? You're not supposed to say that, but I do. I have two and one of them is my favorite. Um, this is one of our favorites. This is with El Centro de la Raza, uh, Plaza Roberto Maestas, and it's a great project. And it's not really my favorite, but uh, Brian is here, so I had to say that. But it, it's an awesome project combining childcare, neighborhood commercial, 
uh, a community center and 112 units of family housing right across the street from a light rail station. So this is, and all, and all the others are exactly what affordable housing can and should be. And our office is there too, that's right. So I go there every day. Uh, this is a, an affordable historic project, combined historic credits and low-income housing tax credits right here in Spokane. Um, I think the neighbor's co neighborhood's called the Hilliard neighborhood. Is that the right? I, Hillman, Hill, Hilliard. Hilliard, uh, it's an old high school and it was converted to affordable housing for uh, low-income individuals. A lot of vets uh, are served here. Anybody been to the new Pike Place Market redevelopment right downtown facing the water? There's a great old stove brewery, best view in town with a beer. This is just to the left of that. That's affordable senior housing, 40 units uh, using uh, low income housing tax credits. Awesome view, uh, obviously. Hope Works Station. Were there some folks from uh, Housing Hope in here? Yeah. Uh, you folks know this project well. This was developed, what, a couple years ago now, a year and a half ago. Has it been that long? Oh my gosh, time flies. So this is a net zero project, meaning that all the uh, energy needs for the residential units are created by solar panels um, uh, on the roof and on the garage there. And on the ground floor is a job training program run by uh, HopeWorks with a cafe and other different job training opportunities. Super cool project. Check that out on Broadway in Everett. And this is another Everett project. This is Colby Avenue Youth Center. This serves uh, a ho of homeless youth, both minors and folks who are 18 to 24. And an incredible need and a great program there run by the Cocoon House. All right, so that's what affordable housing looks like. Let's talk about how it's defined. So affordable housing means that a resident pays no more than 30% of their income for housing. So when you're talking rental housing, you also have to factor in the utility allowance. So you add up someone's rent and their utility costs. If, if that's uh, equal to um, more than 30% of their income, then that is considered by the federal definition to be a, a housing cost burdened household. So um, the federal definition wants people to be paying less than 30% of their income for rent. Um, so people over 30% are cost burdened, people over 50%, we call that severely cost burdened. And it's pretty easy to imagine folks who are paying 40, 50% of their income toward housing costs are, are not able to afford the other needs that they have in their lives. So what we're trying to do is create housing opportunities for folks that are at or below, or at least near 30% of their income. By the way, did I tell you that if you ask a question, you, you can leave. If you don't ask a question, you have to stay. So just keep that in mind, a uh, little motivation. Um, ownership housing is a little bit different. It's a little bit higher because people are building an, uh, an asset. So it's usually more like 35 or 40%. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, exclusively about rental housing because that's what I do and that's what I know. But there is a part of the affordable housing continuum that is affordable uh, home ownership. And there are probably some people in this room who are involved in that. And uh, keep it up. It's an awesome part of the work. But most of the subsidy and most, most of the resources go toward rental housing because those are folks who are lower income and by definition, um, more in need of housing support. Yes, sir. You got out of your, your uh, detention. Good job. No, I don't think the 30% definition will change anytime soon, if ever. It's been that way probably since, I don't know, the 60s maybe. And it's it's, um, it's resilient definition. So I don't think we'll ever see a change in that. Um, okay. 
So it includes a whole range of housing types from shelter, uh, either night to night or uh, transitional shelter, uh, can serve all different types of populations, um, working poor, workforce, um, and, and ownership, which is more in the, in the higher end of the spectrum. So lots of different types of housing can be considered affordable housing. And these are important uh, percentages, a lot of percentages and a lot of acronyms in affordable housing. So um, I'm going to get to what median income is in a moment, but uh, stay with me for a minute. These refer to percent of median income. So if someone is earning zero to 30% of an area median income, that's considered an extremely low income household. 30 or 50% and below is very low. 80% and below is low. There's a little note there though that says 60% because the tax credit program, as you'll see later in the presentation, is the primary source of affordable housing resource that we have, and it caps out at 60%. So most of the housing that we see being developed is serving people at 60 and below. But by definition, uh, low income households go up to 80%. And then moderate income is 80 to 120. Boy, the money's rolling in. Thank you for coming, everybody. Um, any questions on that? All right. So let's talk about median income. So median income, median means the middle, right? So median income means the point in the income continuum for a county where half of the households earn more than that median and half of the households earn less than that median, okay? And every county has its own median income. I mean, some are the same, like King and Snohomish County happen to be the same. A lot of metro counties that are adjacent will have the same median income, but theoretically every county has its own defined median income based on census data. HUD produces an annual um, table with all these incomes. The commission's uh, income and rent chart is based on that HUD data. So we're all using the same definition. So, um, this is a chart for the for a three person household. It's different by household as well. So a one person household, these figures would be lower. A six person household, the figures would be higher. Okay, but I'm using a three person household as an example. So you can see Yakima, um, pretty low median income based on wages and income in that in that county. King and Snohomish, one of the uh, probably the highest in the the state. Um, with 50% median being 58,250. So you can just double that 58,250 and, and understand what the median income is for the, for the county. So three person household median is about 106, no, 116. Okay, now let's convert that to affordable rents. So simple math. 30% of, of someone's income is the threshold. So you just take those income figures, divide by 12, multiply by 30%, okay? And that's what an affordable rent for those household uh, types, this, this is for, um, remember, three-person household, okay? So an affordable uh, rental for a three-person household in Yakima County for household earning 30% of area median income is 533. And for a 60% household in Snohomish King County, 1747. So 1747, that sounds like a lot of money to me, but I'm, I'm old. I mean, I haven't paid rent for a long time and I never paid that much rent. But as anybody is, who's a renter in, in a metropolitan area knows, 1747 does not get you a two bedroom household, uh, a two bedroom unit, right? It's probably 2,500 at the lowest and 3,500 if you're looking at a new market rate building. So you can, you can just see how the rent gap between market and affordable in this calculation. 
Okay. Any questions about this chart? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you for asking that question. I meant to point that out. So by, by HUD definition, um, the theoretical household size for a unit is one and a half people per bedroom. So this is a very nice, easy conversion because we're talking three person household and we're talking two bedrooms. Um, yeah, so two, uh, did I do that right? Yeah, right. So that's, that's uh, an easy conversion. If you're talking about four person households or uh, one person, it's a little bit wonky because you get into half a person, but uh, it, this, this would be with the assumption that a three-person household is in a two-bedroom unit. That's not always the case, but that is for the sake of simplicity in this definition. So thank you for asking that. Yeah. Well, do they have a voucher or they're just paying the tax credit rent? So they would they would pay the amount listed unless the sponsor has some way to write down the rent. And this is an issue with tax credit units because sometimes, let's take the, the King Snohomish example. Sometimes people are making a lot less than $35,000. You, you said $15,000, yeah. So, that 873 is not going to be affordable to that household um, earning $15,000. Well, property managers have different rules around that. Um, the, the basic rule that I hear is that uh, a rent shouldn't be more than two times someone's income. So if someone's earning $15,000, that rent is going to be more than two times their income. So they would probably be denied because what we don't want to do is we don't want to be the ones creating housing burdens for people, right? That's not the point. Um, so a lot of times families can contribute the difference or there are subsidy programs, uh, Section 8 tenant-based vouchers or, or um, uh, other kind of subsidies that can fill, up, fill that gap but it's definitely an issue. Okay, so basic income and rent uh, behind this whole conversation there. So who provides affordable housing? A lot of different entities. Um, come right in. Welcome. Uh, housing authorities, obviously, uh, a lot of nonprofits and social service organizations are providing affordable housing, public agencies, and private market providers. A lot of folks doing um, uh, housing from the uh, private sector, and it's an important part of providing the full continuum. Generally, the nonprofits and social service agencies tend to be serving at the lower income uh, part of the continuum, and for profits are up toward the higher end. Not exclusively, though. All right, so now we're going to talk about the process of developing affordable housing. Very much like uh, developing non-affordable housing, the steps are basically the same. There's a few, just a few details um, and, and issues along the way that are, that are going to be unique to affordable housing. So project definition and feasibility. So defining, I want you all to think of yourself as a developer now, okay? You're at the front end of a project and you're thinking about developing an affordable housing project. So what's, what's your market? Are you working in a particular neighborhood, in a particular region or a particular population? Who are you serving and why? And are you the right entity to serve that? population? What makes you qualified to do that? And you better decide that early because the funders are going to grill you on that later. 
And if you haven't answered that question uh, thoroughly, then it's unlikely to, uh, you're, you're unlikely to succeed in the rigorous uh, funding review process that we have in our world right now. So once you've defined the project and the location, then you would dive into due diligence, just like any real estate developer uh, doing a, a site survey, uh, doing a phase one environmental assessment, uh, looking at the title report, making sure there are no easements or encroachments, and um, doing some early design studies. Then you start to build out your initial pro forma. We'll look at a pro forma later. And you're trying to define your costs. What's your site acquisition going to cost? What's your construction cost? And just double it. <laughs> because that's where we're at, right, John? I mean, depending how long you're going to be in there uh, in the process, uh, these costs are, are definitely skyrocketing right now. Um, define your financing and your soft costs and your reserve requirements uh, to build out a, an initial cost side of your pro forma. And then you're going to look at what sources do you have access to and can you raise enough capital to pay for the costs that you def def defined um, or estimated in the top half? What local subsidy is available to you? Uh, what about tax credits? Are you, we'll talk about tax credits later uh, too, but are you, are you going to be competitive for tax credits? Uh, what rents are you going to charge? And would you have the ability to support any debt based on those rents? And so you've got your costs. Hopefully you've got sources that equal those costs or at least pretty close. So fast, it takes a couple of weeks. If you're good, if you're good. Um, most people <laughs> that can take uh, a year um, and it can, it can easily take four years or more. It just, it depends so much on um, the neighborhood issues, the uh, convincing funders about whether this is the right project. Um, it, can, it can take a very long time, but I would give it at least a year. Then you get to put all of that concept and all that thinking into funding applications. It used to be that we actually literally put them in binders like that. It's not the way. It's not that that way anymore. I kind of miss it. Building binders was somehow rewarding. Do they? But probably just one copy. Yeah. I mean, it used to be like we had to take six copies to the trust fund, six copies to the commission. It was like binder crazy, but mostly electronic. And and hey, you guys are going uh, online. Next 9% application online. Good job. No more binders. I'm so sad. Um, so uh, all those subsidy providers uh, could be city, county, and state, or some combination of those. Um, then the finance agency, Washington State Housing Finance Com Commission, if you're applying for tax credits and or bonds, you have to apply to them. And uh, usually what happens is you... So you, you secure your local funding first and uh, get everybody in the, in the neighborhood supportive, neighborhood meaning your city, county, um, and then you might at the same time apply to the state or apply to the state in the next round, depending on timing. So get those subsidies committed, and then you go to the commission to get your tax credits. I have this rule, uh, full funding rule, you can apply anytime you want, but if you're not fully funded, you just go to the bottom of the list. And in the competitive environment that we're in right now, you will not get funded until you have all the other funds in place. So you have to get fully funded, except for your tax credits and or your bonds, and then you can apply for that as your last step. Okay. Now, Next step, design and permitting, okay? You've done, you've been doing a little bit of design. Yes, sir. Yeah, you built that, didn't you? And you're feeling, you're feeling uneasy about that picture.
Um, yeah, so second bullet under two. Um, well, so it used to be enough that you could just say, we're going to do an affordable housing project located in this spot. Um, and that could be sufficient to succeed in the funding round. But as the funding becomes uh, more competitive and funders and the elected officials behind those funders are deciding, oh, well, we want to serve veterans or we want to serve uh, seniors or, or we want, you know, uh, chronically mentally ill. So it's become uh, less about developing an affordable housing project and more about of developing an affordable housing project for a specific population. So that's what I mean by that. And it's a little bit different for different funders. So you're always kind of changing what the population might be based on what funding you're looking uh, to get. Okay, so design and permit. So um, hopefully you've gotten these funding commitments uh, before you launch into a full scale design and permitting process because it's expensive. Who is an architect? You, you were right. So um, Andrew's got to get paid. So if he's going to do a full on set of construction drawings and permit drawings and follow that through the whole permitting process, that's a lot of funding um, that is required before you close. And so as a developer, unless you're a rich developer, you're going to be hesitant to start that process until you have some certainty around your funding. Now, hopefully you're in a jurisdiction where permitting just, you know, snap of the finger, right? But a lot of jurisdictions are not that way. Um, especially some projects in Seattle I've been on lately, 18 plus months to get a building permit. So sometimes you don't have a choice. Sometimes you got to jump in and you got to just take the guess that you're and take the risk that you're gonna you're gonna get there. But um, most of the time, we we recommend to our clients don't launch fully into your permitting and your design process until you're confident that you uh, are gonna get that funding. All right. So what do you do? What are you doing here? You are trying to design a very functional, high quality, beautiful project. You don't wanna, you don't wanna bring down the bar, do you, right? You're gonna, you gotta meet the, the, the high bar that we set as an industry for how it looks, how it uh, operates, how it feels for the residents. So um, top quality design plus meeting various funding requirements because all those funders that you went to, they have a list of requirements. Maybe it's, um, maybe historic or neighborhood issues or design review issues or um, green and sustainable uh, issues. Pretty much every funding source comes with sustainability requirements and you need an architect that understands that. Um, another challenge is timing. You want that building permit to pop out right before you need to close financing, not after. <laughs> What happens if the building permit comes out after you're supposed to close? You don't close. <laughs> um, so uh, understanding that timing and having a cooperative relationship with your local jurisdiction and permitting agency is, is critical. All right, so now you did get your permit. You're ready to close. Um, does sort of feel like a hockey fight. Um, if if lawyers fight fought right, do lawyers ever fight, Michelle? Never, never. They're uh, it might feel like this, but they're all very polite. I feel like I'm getting beat up. Maybe I should become a lawyer. I wouldn't get beat up so bad. So, um, closing process. Challenge here is you've got different funding sources. You've got city, county, maybe state, maybe you've got a tax credit investor. You've got a construction lender. Each one of those funding sources has at least one lawyer. Sometimes they bring two and they all have to uh, work through, and you've got your own lawyer, hopefully a good one. Um, and they all have to work through uh, negotiating a complex, complicated set of legal and regulatory and financing documents. So uh, it's, it's challenging. Um, 
I noted priority agreement. That's a big part of the conversation. Can uh, what 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 am I talking about here? Priority agreement. Who's on first? What's on second? I'm not talking about the Abbott and Costello uh, shtick either. But what is what am I getting at here? What what's the priority agreement trying to to do for us? Who gets paid first? Right. And also, whose regulatory agreement? Trump. Oh, I got to get rid of that word. It's just so much part of the English language. Uh, has anybody got another word? Like, most important. Okay. Huh? It's precedence. Takes precedence. Um, which, which is better? Stronger? Which regulatory agreement takes precedent? And which financing obligations take precedence? Okay, so that's what the priority agreement is going to say. Tax credit agency, always first. I don't know how you guys do that. Always got to be first. Then generally what happens is the regulatory agreements that uh, correspond to the, the highest loan amount go second, third, fourth. And then the financing, uh, private financing uh, always goes first. And then public subsidy providers, again, by size of loan. So everyone has a regulatory agreement. Everyone has a, a financing deed of trust. So this priority agreement tries to put all of those in a one through 15 order. So super important uh, part of the closing process. Another key challenge is guarantees. So, um, The uh, the funders, the public funders, God love them. They're they're in it for the right reason. Investors and lenders. Did did I see any investors or lenders? Did you, anybody raise your hand? Investors and lenders. Okay. Tina's nodding her head, but she's a good lend investor lender. Um. So I don't want to denigrate investors and lenders too much, but I'm just kidding. They're all, they're good too. They're good too. But they are um. They're in it for the mission, but they got to get paid, right? And they got to mitigate their risk. So they are expecting you as the developer to provide guarantees to counter the risk that they perceive in, that's involved in this project. So if you're doing a 30, $35 million construction project, you are also signing up for guarantees to promise that the project will get done and to promise that the tax credits will get uh, delivered and promise that any operating deficits that occur over time will get paid. So the sponsor is signing up for significant guarantees. So a big part of the closing process is negotiating those guarantees so that they're as fair as possible to all the parties. And that gets harder and harder. And it kind of swings because sometimes it's a buyer's market, sometimes it's a seller's market. So who, you know, whoever's in the driver's seat has a little more leverage on this. And it's never us. It's always the investors in the driver's seat. I don't know how that works. Yeah, so impact of the pandemic on on projects and credit delivery, there's definitely been an impact. Either on the construction side, supply chain issues have delayed completion. So if you finish late, you're delivering credits late. So, you know, we've had multiple projects that had to negotiate a, a fair guarantee compensation. A lot of investors are, are trying to be reasonable and recognize that COVID hit everybody. It's not just bad management on the part of a project, but that was uh, across the board. And then um, some, some projects have been impacted by uh, move-ins. Leasing on some projects is a lot slower than it was pre-pandemic. Um, folks still need affordable housing, but it takes a little bit more to convince folks to move during a pandemic, which is reasonable. Okay, let's keep going. Um, I throw this up just to elucidate 
the idea of what documents are involved in a closing. So this is just one lender. This is that state housing trust fund in most of the projects that we do. And this is a list of all the documents, um, all the main documents, not all the documents, all the main documents um, that are associated with this source. So multiply this by three or four or five different sources and you're tracking a lot of documents. All right, then construction. This is, this is where it all, you know, rubber hits the road. This is where you're spending probably 65%, maybe 70% of your total project development cost is going in right here in the construction phase of the project. This is, you know, why we're all planning the project, why we're all trying to mitigate the risk. So at start of construction, we can proceed without issue. Whether it's new construction or an acquisition rehab, similar, you know, similar challenges. So key, first key part is finding a good contractor, a partner who will understand your unique uh, challenges and who can work with you. Um, contractors, are, they can do everything. They can do anything, right? Have you ever met a contractor who said, oh, no, I can do that. I can do that. But you got to make sure they can do it. If they haven't done it before, it's probably not going to work out very well in their first one. So we need more contractors doing the work. And we have really good contractors, some of them in the room right now, who know how to do this work. Um, so if you want to train a new contractor on how to do this, great, go for it. Um, that Because we need more, but it's risky. So uh, make sure you know what you're doing. Most of the contractors who've done this before understand what they're getting into. Uh, you want a contractor who can price the work fairly, um, who understands your constraints, both in terms of time and money. And you need a contractor who understands the requirements, especially things like prevailing wage rates. Okay, all the public funding comes with prevailing wage uh, requirements, whether it's state or federal or whether it's um, commercial or residential, there's going to be a set of wage requirements that your contractor is going to have to help you track. Um, and then there are oftentimes other requ hiring requirements like Section 3 and women and minority business hiring goals or requirements and apprenticeship requirements. So lots of things that the contractor is going to have to help you uh, promises that they're going to help you make good on because when you got those public funds, you made the promises and then you pass that promise down and you say, contractor, you got to help me make meet, meet these uh, obligations. And then there's lease up and management. This is what leasing and management feels like to me. And that's why I don't do it. It's too, it's too hard. It's too hard. Too many moving parts. Uh, God bless the property managers. Because they have to take all of those promises that you made and they have to run a building meeting all those different rules and just, you know, dealing with people, dealing with people is so hard uh, and, and, you know, maintaining um, a quality environment for folks. It's all very difficult. Um, so leasing up a building, you're going to have lease up requirements. You uh, have promised your funders and your tax credit entities, who you're going to lease up to and when you're going to complete your lease up. So you have to make meet those obligations and then uh, manage the property over time. Okay, so that's a little bit about the process. Any questions? Thoughts? Saving them for later? By the way, there's some cool app that I don't have, but some some people I think submitted questions, and we'll pick those questions up at the end. Uh, hopefully, I've, I will have answered them by then. But if not, we'll pick them up at the end. Okay. Next section: How is it funded? So we've been talking about this, but let's look a little bit more in detail at where the funding sources come from. And there, I'm going to I'm going to divide the funding into two categories. There's the capital funding and the operating funding. 
on the capital side, the subsidies that you need to assemble in order to build the project or acquire and rehab the project. And then the operating, if you need a subsidy to run the project, that would be called an operating subsidy. Some projects need that, some projects don't. We'll get into that difference a little bit later. All right, so where are you gonna go to get those funding commitments? Let's start with the local city and county level. So there's something called an entitlement city. Those are cities and counties that have a certain population size and they get federal home and CDBG, CDBG dollars on a pass-through basis, like City of Spokane, uh, Yakima County, um, Snohomish County. Those are all entitlement uh, jurisdictions. So they get a pot of money and they get to decide how to allocate that. Jurisdictions that are not entitlement cities uh, go to the state and they get to access the same dollars through a state process. Brian. It's population, and I, I don't know what that definition is, but there's a, a population threshold. Anybody happen to know what that is? Um, pardon? 50,000? So we'll go with that. 50,000 uh, jurisdictions with more than that get the, get the entitlement pot. Yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's true. So if a if a small city is in an entitlement county, they can apply to that county for funding. Um, but if an entitlement city or county is in like Ponderay County, I doubt very much that Ponderay County or any city in Ponderay County gets an entitlement. So they either uh, uh, a project in that location would have to go to the state. Okay. Um, property tax levies. There are some jurisdictions that raise uh, funding through uh, a levy on the property tax. City of Seattle has been doing that for something like 35, 40 years, one of the first property tax levies in the country. And City of Vancouver, City of Bellingham have recently added housing levies. And then the King County, uh, the shizzle, they call it. I love saying that. Um, it's easier than the full name, which is Veterans and Human Services and Seniors. I forgot the seniors. Um, they also have a levy that partly goes toward housing. And then 20 and 2063, those are state bill numbers that refer to recording fees. So when you record a real estate document in your, in your county um, recorder's office, they collect a fee and some of that fee goes toward affordable housing. There are regional consortia, uh, ARCH on the, uh, in the Bellevue, Redmond, Kirkland area is such a, a source of funding. 1590 and 1406 are two recent state bill numbers that raise. The first one allows a jurisdiction to increase their sales tax by one-tenth of 1%, 1 and they can dedicate that to affordable housing. 1406 refers to a process whereby a jurisdiction can retain some of the sales tax that it's supposed to pass through to the state and they can keep it and 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 use that for affordable housing. So a lot of new uh, uh, funding sources coming through uh, the state legislative process and more to come hopefully in this next uh, biennium. All right, then let's talk about the state level. So state commitment to affordable housing is super critical, especially in all those places that don't have a property tax levy. All right, and uh, I've been keeping track of this. I've, done, I've been doing this presentation for a while. So uh, I keep track of the biennial commitment to the housing trust fund. So check that out. In uh, 07, 09, $200 million. Then it fell for many years uh, 08, we all know what happened in 08. Um, and it took a while for that to trickle through. We hit a low point down here in 15, 17. And then it wasn't until just this last biennium that we beat that 200 million and we blew it out of the water. $714 million toward affordable housing in the last biennial budget. 
And that's a, a combination of a lot of things. I don't think we'll see that number again because a big part of that was uh, rapid acquisition money. And those, both of those numbers were passed through dollars from the ARPA legislation, uh, federal COVID relief legislation. No, it, it was all committed and spent. Yeah. Because a, legisl a legislator who looks at a fund balance after the biennium is going to say, well, you don't need that much. You didn't spend it. So we, we make sure we use it all. Okay, so state housing trust fund, critical part of our, our funding landscape. And then there are lots of other uh, state funding opportunities too. It's direct appropriations. Sometimes legislators will get a direct appropriation through the legislature. Um, CBG housing enhancement, that's the non-housing or the non-entitlement pot that we were talking about. State level 20, 2063, real estate excise tax, TIF light, TIF light uh, refers to tax increment financing, and that's a uh, a it's a funding mechanism that has been used in a lot of states, but was determined to violate our state constitution. So it's not available, but we're trying some pilot programs to use that. And in, in real quickly, what it does is it it takes the tax the the tax assessment value of an underdeveloped community as the baseline. And then a community invests to create more development in that location. And the increment that uh, of tax value that grows through that development is called the tax increment. And some of that tax, uh, the property taxes that come from that increment can be invested in further development of things like affordable housing or infrastructure. So it's a great tool trying to get it to work in Washington has been challenging. And of course, like I said, ARPA was a big shot in the arm. All right, federal. So federal, there are a lot of different programs. In general, however, the federal role in affordable housing has been on the decline for the last like 30 plus years. Ever since Newt Gingrich said, housing doesn't have a constituency. So nobody complains when, when we cut it. And it's true. We have not advocated as a, as a nation very effectively uh, for housing. It's a whole bunch of philosophical reasons for that um, that I won't go into. But there is new recognition of the importance of housing and, and housing stability. So we are seeing a growing uh, commitment. Not, nowhere near what where we used to be on the federal level, but at least some, some growth and some recognition. Um, I, won't, I won't list all these programs here. Well, I will, I will mention Section 8. Other than the tax credit program, Section 8 is the biggest and the most important housing program that we have. And who can explain what a, what a Section 8 is? Anybody want to let me stop talking for a minute? Yeah. Yep, it, it subsidizes someone's rent. So it pays for a portion of someone's housing cost. So someone who has a Section 8 voucher, and those are administered by housing authorities, but the bill is paid by HUD at the federal level, uh, that voucher entitles someone to pay 30% of their income for rent in a housing unit. Despite what the rent may be, the voucher will pay the difference. So let's let's say someone someone 30% of someone's income is $300, but the rent is $1,000. The voucher pays the $700 difference, okay? Super valuable, incredibly important to stabilize extremely low-income households. Also very expensive because as housing goes up astronomically and incomes for low-income people stay flat, the, the delta grows every year. So while affordable housing... Um, costs at the federal level have declined, the portion of that that is uh, covered or, or, or used for voucher program has increased, almost crowding out the other programs. Um, 
So tough balance to achieve. And then the National Housing Trust Fund. This is a new, relatively new program where, and I don't even understand how, how the, the federal agencies like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, a portion of their profits goes into the National Housing Trust Fund, and then those are allocated to states. In 2021, Washington received $16 million um, to allocate uh, on, that, on that basis. The Housing Trust Fund. So when we go to the state uh, for a housing trust fund award, there the same process is used to allocate the national housing trust fund. You know, I'm I'm less acquainted with that because I'm less uh, uh, engaged in the services program, but I believe every county has a, uh, a continuum of providers that help inform counties how to utilize the McKinney funds. So I think every county gets a pot and then they decide where to invest the, those operating subsidy dollars. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Tina's asking about the complexity of layering all of these funding sources together. It would be awesome if someone um, could just pay for the whole thing, right? But everybody loves this phrase called leverage. You know, I put $2 million into this project, but I leveraged 20 million um, because all those other sources paid the difference. So everybody likes to brag at how much leverage they're creating, and the leverage only occurs when you have lots of different sources, right? So that funder that's saying, I'm getting all this leverage, if they paid for the whole thing, they would do one project instead of 10 projects, right? So um, yes, there's conversation about changing that. I don't think it's because people want to simplify the process, though. I think it's really just because there's not enough leverage sources to go around. So like, let's talk about the city of Seattle. The city of Seattle is trying to increase the amount of money it's investing in affordable housing dramatically. But the leverage dollars, how much the state puts in, how much tax credits are available, those aren't changing as fast as the city's commitment is increasing. So the city is talking about putting more money and getting less leverage, but it's not a very popular uh, conversation. It's a difficult conversation, but that's the type of thing we have to do if we're going to um, do more housing uh, without more resources from all levels. And, you know, it used to be HUD paid, the, paid for the whole thing, right? 40, 50 years ago, HUD just wrote a check. Um, you didn't have to talk about leverage, but that's not probably coming back anytime soon. Okay. How you doing? Doing all right? I don't see too many people sleeping, so maybe one or two here and there, but I can deal with that. That's less than less than 1%, so I'm okay with that. All right, here's my question for you. And if you know the answer, don't, don't say it. I want, to, I want the people who don't know the answer to guess. It's more fun that way, okay? So what federal agency runs the nation's largest housing production program? HUD is a good guess. FEMA, USDA, those are all good guesses. Agriculture, very good guess. They do invest in housing. Not the largest program, though. Military, good. Bob, be quiet. I know that was you. I mean, like you cover your mouth like it's not you, but I know it was you. It's funny. It's a funny answer. It is the IRS. No, can you believe that? 
the Internal Revenue Service runs the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program because it's a tax benefit program. And so the largest program that we have is actually administered by tax, the, uh, the IRS. I don't know but, about you, but the IRS is not my favorite federal agency. Um, but God bless them for running this program because it really is the, the essential uh, uh, part of how we get the, the, this, this affordable housing built. So it was signed in 1986 by the Gipper himself. And funny enough, this was the biggest tax reform package prior to the 2017 Trump tax reform. And like the 2017 tax, uh, Trump tax reform, it basically benefited corporations and wealthy people. Surprise. So how did the, tax, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program come out of a major uh, corporate tax benefit? Well, it's because it was some crumbs that they could give to advocates who said, you know, you're giving away, you know, tax benefits to wealthy people and corporations. How about a little for, for the, the poor people? And so the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program was born. And I don't think anybody expected it to last for, what, 35 years now and be extremely successful. But it is extremely successful. Over 3 million units of housing created since inception. It's supported by people on both sides of the aisle. Um, one side of the aisle likes it because it uh, serves a public benefit. Uh, the other side of the aisle, for sake of simplicity, likes it because it is a business-driven program. It's an incentive for corporations to invest in housing. And in return, those corporations get a tax benefit. So I think about it as a triangle. Three entities involved here. The federal government gives a tax benefit to corporations. The corporations give equity to affordable housing providers. And the affordable housing providers create affordable housing, which is a public good and is necessary um, to stabilize our communities. All right. So all those entities involved in a mutually beneficial cycle. And that's why it survives may not be the most efficient way to do housing. The old HUD way was the efficient way to do housing. You know, one check and you build a bunch of units, but that was not politically sustainable. This program is politically sustainable because it has fans um, from uh, all sides. Not everyone's a fan, but it has a lot of support. So, uh, it is a dollar for dollar reduction in a corporation's tax liability. Okay. So it's not cash. The, the treasury is not writing checks to corporations. What the treasury is doing is telling a corporation, oh, you, you invested in this affordable housing project. So I'm going to, I'm going to write off some of your taxes. I'm going to credit or forgive some of your taxes. And so in that way, it's like cash but it doesn't come from the federal government. It's cash that didn't go to the federal government, right? How tricky is that? Because that's invisible. That's not an expenditure. That's a, that's a opposite of an expenditure, right? It's, an, it's a non-expenditure. And that's another reason why it's, um, why it's popular because it doesn't show up in the budget. The tax credit uh, is a 10 year credit. So, you go to the State Housing Finance Commission, our friends Bob and Claire over here, and you get an allocation for an annual amount of tax credits. And you get, if you're successful, you get that tax allocation, that tax benefit allocation for a period of 10 years. Okay, and I'll tell you what you're gonna do with that in a minute. But the compliance period for that tax credit is 15 years. I don't know why. I guess they didn't want everybody to disappear after 10 years. But even after 15 years, the reality is the commitments that you promised all those public funders in order to get the money, those last for 40, 45, 50 years. So you're not getting out, you're not getting out of this thing anytime soon, not in the current environment. Um, investors purchase the tax credits. 
So what you're going to do is after you get that allocation, you're going to go out to investors who are in the business and you're going to say, hey, I just got a million dollar tax allocation for 10 years. You want to buy it? And they're going to offer you um, a price to buy that tax benefit. Because if that tax benefit's no good to you as a developer, you can't use it. Only corporations um, can use this and corporations with a consistent tax liability. So that narrows the world down to mostly banks and other high profitability uh, corporations, tech companies, cell phone companies, insurance companies, but mostly it's banks. The other reason it's mostly banks is because there's something called CRA, which is Community Reinvestment Act. And CRA is a toothless federal legislation that tells banks who want to merge that they better have been investing funding in their local community. If they're going to come and ask a favor of the regulatory agencies to merge, they got to get approval for that. Then they have to show a track record of investing in the communities where they have deposits. So that means banks are motivated not only because they're going to get a tax benefit, but because they're going to get a CRA credit. So what that means is banks tend to price things a little bit more um, uh, aggressively than a non-CRA investor. The non-CRA investor, we call that an economic investor. They're in it just for the economics. Well, and some mission. They, you know, it, there's mission too. But the CRA investor is in it for mission, economics, and CRA. So they have a little extra motivation. Okay, bottom bullet, I want to stress, the money is not debt. You don't, you don't have, you're the developer who got this allocation. You don't pay it back. It's equity in the project. The payback comes through that tax credit, right? And the tax benefits associated with the, with the uh, credits. That's why it's so beautiful. You don't have to pay it back. So here's that a million dollar example, the org chart. I want to show you the org chart of how this works. So the, uh, the sponsor would create a limited partnership or a limited liability company to be the owner. So every tax credit project is owned by a se separate entity. It's a lot of legal work. <laughs> it's a lot of accounting. Another reason why the pro pro project is uh, popular has a lot of beneficiaries. So you set up a limited partnership. The sponsor would be the general partner with a very small economic interest, but a lot of the day-to-day -day responsibilities are over here. But the investor uh, would be the limited partner with a 99.99% economic interest. The reason that's so lopsided is because the owner wants to give them as much of the tax credit benefit as possible because the more tax credit benefit they get, the more equity the investor is gonna to give to them, okay? So it looks funny, but really the sponsor's running the thing on the day-to-day -day, and the investor is looking over their shoulder to make sure they don't screw up. So here's that $10 million of tax savings over a 10 year period. You're gonna go out to the market and you're gonna sell that. Let's say your, your highest bidder is 95 cents uh, per credit. Okay, so nine and a half million dollars of equity. That buyer is telling you they're going to give you nine and a half million dollars of equity today. Well, more or less today during the construction process. Um, if they get $10 million of, of tax benefits over the life of the credit. So what happens if you go out and the market's not quite so strong, either because there's a lot of uncertainty in the market because of tax reform or because of COVID or because of the 08 financial crash. Um, so some, or your, your project is perceived to be in a risky housing market. So they come back when they say, we'll give you 85 cents. Okay, cool. But that million dollar difference, you got to make that up somewhere else. So when the market is down, then the public subsidy providers have to fill more gaps. And right now, construction costs are going through the roof, right? So that's another way to create more gap. Guess who has to fill that gap? Investors can't pay more. 
so public subsidy providers are having to fill gaps created by the co current cost increases. All right, questions about that part of the process. Well, uh, I don't know if I, um, I can answer that question. Um, there's, there are definitely investors who want to do tax credits, but there's kind of a, there's a point of at which they no longer make any money, right? They got to make some money because they are investing and they require a return. So there's kind of a bottom. And depending on how, a project is structured and how the tax system is working at the particular time, that bottom right now is about mid nineties. Um, but for a project in a rural area, that's probably more like 85 cents. So while there are lots of investors out there, there's a certain point at past which they can't go. And there are certain risks that they can't accept. So there are a lot of dollars out there, especially if they only have to pay like 80 or 85 cents, right? But that's not enough. So um, we're, we, we're always pushing them to get more dollars. The good thing is there's right now more investors than there are credits. So that's good. That keeps the price up. Yeah, back in, in the back and then I'll come to you, sir. Yeah, yeah, I would just generally, if the if the market is soft, then that's going to create more gap that have to, has to be filled by somebody else. Yeah. Yes, yes. How much they profit depends on that price, right? Yes, sorry, and then. No, the... the um, the federal government gives the tax credit to our friends Claire and Bob at the Washington State Housing Finance Commission. Every state has an allocating agency. So the federal, the treasury says based on population, you, Washington State, get X amount of tax credits and X amount of tax exempt bond uh, authority. Then as you as the developer apply for that. So then the allocating agency says, okay, you win, you get that million dollars of credit. Then the bank is the one gonna buy that credit from you. So the credit comes from the federal government through the state to the developer, and then the developer sells that to the bank or to the investor, okay? Uh, tax credits? Yeah, yeah, they, they, will, they would buy, um, in major banks like U.S. Bank, Bank of America, Key Bank, you know, all those national banks, Wells Fargo, they have huge investment departments that are just placing money in tax credit projects. Yeah. So, sir, I skipped you. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. There was a time. Oh, it was a glorious time when credit prices were more than a dollar. So can someone explain why that might be? How could, how could a bank get a return if they're giving this, like on this example, if they're giving, let's say they're giving $11 million for $10 million of tax credits. Why would they do that? The CRA need would help, but there's another thing. What'd you say? It's not tied to interest rates. Um, it's tax depreciation. 
the invest and real estate investment has another type of benefit. Everybody who invests in real estate also gets a uh, tax loss benefit. And those losses are driven by depreciation. So when you build a, a $35 million project, that project is going to have depreciation driven losses over the life of the project. And those losses are also a tax benefit, not as valuable as a tax credit because a tax loss is a deduction, but it's still a benefit. So those, the tax credit and the depreciation together can drive the economic return such that an investor would pay more than a dollar. The 2017 tax reform changed that, changed the depreciation rules so that depreciation became less valuable to investors and therefore uh, reduced pricing to below a dollar. Thanks for asking that. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I skipped that bullet. Thanks for, for asking that. So there's two types of tax credit. There's a 4% tax credit and a 9% tax credit. So bottom line, nine is better than four, okay? Any other questions? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the 9% is better than a four in the sense that it's a richer subsidy. Um, there's a calculation. If we get to it, I'll show you how, how it works. But basically, you multiply a thing called basis times the credit percentage, which is 9% or norm, not 4%. And so that 9% drives a... Uh, a higher tax credit result. So you're selling more credits in a 9% program than if you have a 4% allocation. So when you sell more credits, you get more money. The thing about the 9% program is it's limited. It's, uh, there's only a certain amount that every state gets. And so when it's gone, it's gone. And so it tends to be um, much more competitive and the powers that be, uh, the commission, the funders, the, the, the advocates have basically decided that in Washington state, we wanna use the 9% program for the neediest populations. So permanent supportive housing, uh, rural projects, the people that are hardest to serve, those are the type of populations that are uh, competitive for the 9% program. The 4% program, oh, and clapping. All right, we got, we got 15, we got 15 minutes. Um, the 4% program um, creates less equity and so tends to be used for projects that are serving the higher end of the continuum. So 50% and 60% AMI households, okay? And although the 4% program, the 4% credit is not limited, 4% credits go with a tax exempt bond allocation, okay? And it used to be, that there was plenty of bond uh, authority to go around. And so we used to call the 4% program automatic, but it's not automatic anymore because there's, there's an oversubscription and over demand for bond authority. So that means it's harder to get bonds, which means it's harder to get 4%. But the thing, the main difference is the, the amount of subsidy is greater for a 9% program. And so is used generally to serve the lowest income population. That help? That's very possible. Yeah. So as interest rates go up, bond projects become uh, it's more difficult to to make them pencil, uh, and so there could be a decrease in demand for for uh, four percent credits. Yes. But as long as there are public subsidy providers out there willing to, Dan, I didn't, when did you sneak in? I should have been calling you out too. I've been picking on Claire and Bob this whole time. Uh, Dan, I got to pick on you some more. Only got 15 minutes. Um, so yeah, as, but as long as there are public subsidy dollars to fill the gap, um, hopefully we'll continue to utilize the 4% program to its full potential. Okay, this is great. We're covering some good ground. Good questions. Thank you, everybody. This makes it more fun for sure. Where were we? All right. 
let's do this real quick. How does it pencil? All right. Um, what I want to get at here is the question of how, how, does, how does it, why does it take all of these subsidy programs to make this work? Why can't we just do this in the marketplace? Well, certain parts of the, of the affordable housing need can be done with the market place with private motivated capital, but a lot of it can't. And I want to touch on why that is. Okay. So let's look at a $20 million uh, conventional real estate deal. Okay. Something like uh, uh, 60, 70% of that project cost is going to be covered by debt. And the different, the rest is going to be covered by equity that the private market, uh, the private developer has to invest in the project, right? And that equity, the, the rent income pays for the debt. And then if there's a little left over, that pays back the equity provider. And then when the project gets sold, the appreciation, the higher value of the real estate further compensates the equity provider, okay? Why can't we do that? Well, the people who do affordable housing don't have a lot of equity to put in a project. And even if they did, why would they do that? The rents are restricted and they're not gonna sell the project generally. So they're not gonna get return uh, on an annual basis and they're not gonna get return by flipping the project. So it doesn't make economic sense to invest significant equity in affordable project. So how, we have to make that up in different ways. The other thing is the rental income is restricted because you're serving poor people. So you're not gonna have a lot of money to provide debt. So you might have a little debt, the biggest slug of your money is gonna come from the tax credit equity, and then the difference is gonna come from public subsidy. Now, let's look at how projects uh, work on an operating basis, okay? So that first slide was the capital uh, perspective. Now we're running the project, okay? So a conventional real estate deal, got your market rents, deduct your operating expenses, your debt payments, and you have some cash flow. Okay, but what if you're renting to, uh, and this is assuming a 50 or 60% AMI project, okay? So there's gonna be some cash flow, but not a lot because your rents are lower, your operating expense is probably a little higher, it might have a little bit of debt payment, and you have a tiny bit of cash flow, okay? But not really enough to pay back uh, more debt or, or conventional capital. All right now, that's a 50 or 60% deal. What if you're trying to serve 30% households? All right, then you basically have practically no income from rents. You have higher expenses and supportive service costs. And so just to break even, you're going to need some kind of operating subsidy, okay? And that's where the Section 8 program or state operating and maintenance subsidies or service dollars come in to make that project just break even on a year-to-year -year basis. Okay, now we're running low on time. So... There, 10 more minutes. So I'm just gonna flash through these, okay? This, this is, uh, we'll call this part two, all right? So we'll, we'll cover this next time, whenever that is. But this is your basic pro forma, all right? So land costs, construction costs, as, as I was pointing out, the biggest number you got here is construction and contingency and sales tax. That's the bulk of your cost. But then there's insurance, reserves, developer fee, et cetera. Then you put that through the tax credit calculation. And I'm not going to try to explain it all, but just think of it as a whole bunch of multiply this, divide by that, and you get a number down here at the bottom. All right. So that project, yeah, like I said, part two, that project, $19 million project, 60 units, it's probably going to cost more now. I need to update these numbers. Um, based on a whole bunch of assumptions that live in the tax credit application world um, and assuming a 95% pricing, you can come away with $11.9 million and then other sources of funds are gonna fill out your capital stack. 
So what I, what I wanna show you here is the, the number that's different is right there. In this, pro, in this project, we have 130%. That's called a basis boost. When you're in a qualified census tract, which is a high poverty area, or you're in a rural location, or you're in what's called a DDA or a difficult to develop area, you get a 30% boost. That's worth a lot of money because if you're not in that 30% boost and you're using 100% right there in that part of the calculation, we just created a $2.7 million gap on our project. So um, guess, where, guess who's gonna pay for that? Public subsidy providers. So unfortunately, um, the demand uh, for projects uh, like this and projects that are suffering from cost increases, it, it kind of comes back to the public subsidy providers. And then this is an operating pro forma. So really quick, you're just taking your unit type, how many, what are the tax credit rents, deduct the utility allowances, because remember the utilities are in the calculation. So you take those out, multiply that out. There's your gross income, vacancy, either five or 7%, take that out. You've got an effective gross income of 483 on this project. Then your expenses, okay? Uh, utilities, management, reserves, et cetera. In this case, we've assumed six, uh, 6945 per unit per year. That's pretty good these days. Everything is going up. Inflation is impacting staffing costs, uh, vendor costs, insurance costs. So that number is being pushed up dramatically these days. But total expenses, deduct that from your income and you get a how much cash flow you have. There's something I want you to notice. That cash flow number is going down. Okay? Because it's standard, it's standard to assume that your expenses are going to go up faster than your rents. Remember, these are not market rents. These are restricted uh, based on those HUD uh, charts, right? So we usually use 2% inflation on the rents, 3% on the expenses, or two and a half and three and a half. So no matter what, there's going to be a crossover at some point where you, and, and it's, it's mathematically different for every project. But in this project, the decline starts immediately. So the investor, what they want to see, and I couldn't fit it on here, but they want to see what happens over here. In what year? 15. They want to know what happens in year 15 because that's when their compliance re uh, responsibilities are done. Remember, 10-year credit period, 15-year compliance. So the investor gets to skedaddle in year 15. So if you go negative after year 15, they're not so concerned about that. They just want to make sure you're positive in year 15. And the assumption is in year 15, you're going to buy the project, hopefully for a, for a dollar. Um, and then it's likely to need a refinance at that point anyway. So you're going to have to restructure the deal. Um, so um, real quick, the future, who knows? <laughs> Inflation, everything is costing more. Interest rates going up creating uncertainty and instability. The resource uh, demand is still, the demand for resources continues to outstrip the availability. Even though jurisdictions, the state, et cetera, are increasing their housing investments, the need still uh, outstrips the available resources. Um, there's kind of an anti-tax sentiment, um, unless you live in Seattle. Seattle pays any tax. Just put it on the ballot, man. Um, but otherwise, there is, continues to be anti-tax sentiment, which makes it hard. Luckily, investors are very much in the market. So tax credit interest and, and pricing stays pretty strong. All right, I'm just going to skip to the pretty picture at the end. Thank you for your interest. This is why we do affordable housing, uh, to create happy, stable households, families, seniors, etc. So Keep up your good work. Continue to invest in affordable housing. I will hang out here for a while to ask any questions. If 
Uh, let me let me tell you what. It's 426. I'm going to let you all go early. But if you ask one of those questions on the uh, application and I didn't answer it, then come up and ask me afterwards, okay? So thank you very much. I hope this was of interest. I will stay here and ask questions uh, for a while. Thanks, everybody.